Hi, everyone. Welcome to um, our packages book club with R for DS. Uh, this week, we are going over chapter seven data in our packages. And we have Kaya presenting the data chapter. OK, hi, everybody. Um, so I was excited to do this one because handling data in packages is something that I've tried to grapple with myself and found it really confusing. And it was good for me to have like an excuse to actually do it in a methodical way. Um, disclaimer, I'm really new to making slides with book down. So if anything looks funky, I, you know, I'll fix it later and do the pull request. There, there weren't already slides for this chapter, so I did my best. Um, okay, so some off the cuff learning objectives here. Um, this chapter will have us understanding why and how to include data in a package, and it differentiates between different types of data that we might want to put in our package and sort of the different use cases for, for those different types of data, and then also goes over how to document um, data in the package. Okay, um, how do I just do it by? There we go. Okay, so some reasons that we might want to include data in our package. Um, one major reason, and this is the one that I've run across um, in my own experience, is to help with function documentation, to be able to show good examples in the vignettes of loading and processing data and actually having functions that interact with data. Um, or you might be writing a data package, such as Palmer Penguins, which some of you might be familiar with. And in that case, the intention of the package is to actually distribute the data itself, and there aren't very many other functions, if any, in the actual package. And then the third reason is that the functions might need data internally. So for example, if your function compares something to a lookup table, like uh, the example they gave in the book was comparing to a table of colors, maybe you need that information stored internally so that the function can refer to that data. Um, there's a couple other sort of more peripheral cases of using data to preserve state that we'll talk briefly about later, but these are sort of the main um, focuses of the chapter. Um, so just an overview of the main use cases and um, file paths for where you end up storing the data for those use cases. Sorry, just a second. My windows are a little bit of a mess. Okay. So if you want to provide our objects to the user, such as the Palmer Penguins data, which exports the, the uh, data set penguins, you'd be storing that in the data folder of your package. If you want our objects for internal use by functions, you're going to be storing them in a single RDA file called sysdata.rda, and that actually lives in the R directory, which is a bit confusing. And we'll go over all of this in more detail in a bit. And then if you want to provide raw data for the user, not necessarily in an RDA format, it would go in the inst -ext data folder, and we'll also talk more about that. Um, and then there's also a couple other things that the chapter touches on, which is dynamic state data and persistent um, user configuration data. Okay, so let's talk about that first use case, which is exported data, where you actually want to provide data to the user. These are our objects for the user. They are saved as RDA files, um, usually from the save function, and they're saved as single R um, objects with the same name as the file. And lazy data is set to true in the description file, which allows the data to be loaded lazily, so only loaded when it's needed on the user side. To do that easily, you would use the use this function, use data, which automatically saves your data file in the correct place and automatically sets lazy data to true in the description file. So here's an example of doing that. Let's say you create some data um, that you want to use in your package, and then you use the use this use data function to automatically save it to the right place in your directory. Um, Stas has a question. Yeah, so there is some trickery that happens between source and bundle and binary that the paths get changed. So you 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 provided paths on the previous slide, and uh, I presume that this is for the source version of the package. Yeah, so you're right. talking about this one here. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but yes, you're right. This is for um, this is for the source version of the package, and then it does I get when the package is installed. I think they will all continue to exist, but some of the contents might get changed. Yeah, um, that'll come in. Uh -huh. a, in a okay, awesome. Slide. Thanks. Yeah. 
Um, okay, so if you do this, so if you export your data and you save it in the data folder, then it will be available to the package user and they can access it either using the double colon. Um, so for example, package double colon my package data, or they can just load your package and then they can directly call the name of the data file. Um, just like this, for example, you load Palmer penguins and then you call the name penguins and you have access to that as a variable. Um, okay, so this code that I presented, so this was one of the hardest things for me to understand in this chapter is like, where does the data creation stuff happen? And then where's the data itself saved? So we're gonna go over that, I'm gonna belabor that a little bit. So this code, this example code for creating a data file and then saving that data file into the right place in your package, this code itself has to live somewhere, right? It's not just one-time code that happens in your console. And it also should not go in the R directory where all of your functions are stored, because where your functions are stored, that's going to get um, that's going to get read, you know, when the package is loaded every time, and that isn't an appropriate place to be recreating your data every single time. So in a moment, we're going to talk about where you actually put this code, but just stay tuned for that. Another note on the exported data is that they recommend it all being RDA files and other types of files are not recommended. Um, they mention that that's because RDA files are already sort of nice and um, I guess like portable and they are gonna work right out of the box with use this. Um, if anybody knows more details on why it would be a really bad idea to have like a CSV exported in your data folder, um, you can chime in here, but there is, we are going to talk a little bit about um, a case where you explicitly want to have different types of files. The the RDA is just, that's what our packages use. So like mm -hmm. when you library a package, it will library or, or well, it doesn't automatically load that, but that's the whole, you know, that's what load uses and that's what right. lazy, lazy data uses. So it's it's not so much like because this is the best one, it's because that's the one. That's just how you do it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I well, think I also that in those files, there are binary files because the comma separate files need to be encoded by RDO. It's like when you load a CSV, you need to say, RL, this is a string, this is a number, this is an integer. Mm -hmm. But a binary file, right. you don't need to that, so it's faster the, the importation process because right. all that metadata is linked in that type of file. Right, that makes sense. Okay, thank you both. <laughs> um, right, so about lazy loading, which is a concept that I also hadn't fully understood until this. So lazy loading basically just means that the data isn't actually loaded into R's memory until it is explicitly called for. Um, so you turn on lazy loading for um, exported data by setting the lazy data parameter to true in the description file. And once again, that, that happens automatically when you use the use this use data function. And they give this example in the chapter where they check the, the amount of memory used when they have when they're loading the NYC flights 13 package, which contains a data file that's exported to the user with flight data. And you see that the amount of memory used before and after loading the package is not very different. But then when you actually um, try to do something with this flights data object, now there's a lot more memory used because now that file is actually loaded into ours memory. But it's not loaded into ours memory as soon as the package is loaded with a library call. I thought this was kind of a cool way of demonstrating that. And once again, use data automatically sets this. I'm getting more and more convinced throughout this book that it's a good idea to use use this because I can never remember all the things that have to go in all the different places and everything has to be set exactly right for things to work and use this just sort of streamline, streamlines all of those things. Okay, so speaking of creating package data, they talk about preserving the origin story of package data. Um, you could theoretically just in your console or in a temporary script, you could create a data object and then you could save it to your package and export it to the user, but then the user won't really know what the data is or where it comes from or how it was generated. And they had an interesting note in the chapter about how some of the data that ships with the ggplot2 package, actually its origin has been lost and nobody knows where it comes from, which I thought was kind of funny. 
Um, but ideally we would like to avoid that. Um, somebody's got something in the chat. They really, yeah, they really hit the nail on the head with the packaging for use this. I like that. Um, yeah, absolutely. So if we do want to preserve the origin story of our package data and we don't want it to get lost to the sands of time, which is, I believe, what they said for ggplot, um, we need to actually use a script in order to run those operations to create the data and to save the data. And that script itself gets, um, gets saved in the data raw folder. Um, as an R file. So notice that most of your R files when you're making a package are going to be saved in the R folder and they're going to be files with function definitions and function documentation in them, but that's not where you should put this code that generates the data. And that's because this is like workflow code. It's, it's code that you basically do one time. Um, and so you should put it in the data raw folder and then include the data raw folder in the R build ignore. So that's not going to be run every time the package is built. A typical script in data raw includes the code to prepare a data set and then ends with a call to use data. So going back a couple of slides, this data, or sorry, this code, which ends with a call to use data would be stored in an R script in the data raw folder. And to do this, um, you can again use, use, use this. You can just do use this use data raw, which creates and sets up the data raw folder and automatically lists it in the R build ignore. And then this next line I was confused about, um, they give an example using use this use data raw, and then the name of a data object in quotes. Did anybody understand what happens here? Like, is this an already existing object or does this create an R script named after that object it's yeah. that. It, it just it just picks up that well it resolves the this this character string finds basically uh object exists runs objects exist to find it there and then evolves this and um picks up the object and puts this into my package data.rda that's that's what's happening oh i see so it looks for whether you've created an object called my package Not, that's that's oh, use that's, data. That's, uh, use, that's use data. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Use data raw uh, when you give it a name is just going to create a file okay. for you to use to okay. um, to describe how to create it. By default, it it does. I don't remember what it does, but it makes it makes a file if you don't give it a file name there or a name. Um, yeah, sorry, I was confused. So, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they didn't explicitly say that. Mm -hmm. So this code here, then it would basically. Um, it would create a, yeah. a blank R file called my package data, and then it would open that up, and then you would go ahead and put this data, sorry, put this code into that file. Yes. Okay, cool. That That is sort of what I thought it must be. Um, let's see. I'm, I'm not going to keep opening the chat. Can somebody let me know if there's <laughs> something in the chat that needs me to pause? Because, it, yeah, it's hard to keep opening it. Um, okay. So... Because we're exporting data sets to the user, um, just like when we export functions to the user, we need to document those data sets. And the, this is very similar to documenting a function, but instead of documenting the entire code for the function, what you document is the name of the data set, which threw me for a loop a little bit. Um, and that gets saved in the R folder along with the scripts that make your functions and include your function documentation. And then presumably when you do um, when, when you build all the documentation, it will generate man files for the data as well. So here's an example of a data documentation. Um, let me make that smaller. Okay. So here's some example. Here's an example of documenting the World Health Organization TB data, and you can see that it still has the title. It has a slightly extended description, just like you would do for a function. And then these um, these our oxygen tags are a little bit different here. You have one that um, includes the format. And here they say that it's a data frame with a certain number of rows and columns. And then they use this syntax, this describe syntax, which was also new to me, to actually describe all of the fields in the data frame. Um, so it's a bit meta, it's sort of like you're describing function arguments, um, but this other layer of complexity. So here we're describing that the country variable refers to the country name, et cetera, et cetera. And then the source here is just a URL or a description of where the data comes from. 
And then at the bottom, instead of doing at export and then having the entire function code, all they have is a character string containing the name of the data file. And they explicitly say, do not use the at export oxygen tag. Um, so yeah, so note the text format and source and don't export a data set. I don't really know what would happen if you tried to do that. Does anyone know? That will override the lazy loading that you explained of the memory. Oh. So when you call library the package, it will load all the data you have, even the mm -hmm. user is not using that data. Gotcha. Yeah, and that could be presumably really bad because then you're just like flooding the user's memory with a bunch of stuff. Okay, that's that's helpful. Thank you. Um, cool. All right. Then they have a note about um, special characters and data, and they recommend using UTF-8 encoding. I tried not to go too much down this rabbit hole. They linked to um, some documentation, like a manifesto for why everyone should use UTF-8. Um, I personally don't have a rock solid understanding of these different types of encoding, but they do mention some functions that are useful to use in your data generation script to make sure that your data actually are encoded in UTF-8. And then you can also um, explicitly in, in, include a note in the description file to say that your package data is encoded in UTF-8. Um, okay, so the second category of data that we're going to talk about is internal data, which is our objects for functions internal use that won't be accessible to the user. And they mentioned that for small, simple objects, um, like if you just need to off the cuff define a vector or something for the function to use, it's totally fine to just define those in the same R code where the function is defined, for example, with C or with data frame, and that would be in the code that's stored in the R folder. Um, but if you want to make something bigger, for example, the example they gave was in the Munsell and Dichromat packages, they're comparing to a big table of color codes and they need to store that table of color codes. Um, you need to store that separately in um, sysdata.rda. And this will be automatically lazy loaded, um, regardless of whether the lazy load parameter in description is set to true. It'll just be automatically lazy loaded because that's how internal data is handled. So the example they give of how to create internal data is you write some code to create an internal object, internal this, you write some more code to create internal that, and then you use, once again, this function from use this, use data, to list out all of the internal objects and specify internal equals true. And this is where this differs a little bit from the exported data because all of the internal data objects are gonna be mushed together into this single RDA file called sysdata.rda instead of stored as their, their own separate um, RDA files. So you would go back and um, add more if you, um, if you needed to add more. And once again, the code to generate the internal data also lives in an R script in data raw, just as with the exported data. Um, yeah, so this makes these available to the functions that you write for use um, and available to you as the developer when you when you use load all as well, if you need to test stuff out. Um, right, I just said this, okay. So then the two differences that they highlight between internal data and exported data is that, first of all, you don't need to document internal data because it isn't exported to the user. They are not going to be seeing um, anything about it. And then also the lazy data equals true parameter and description only applies to the exported data, but internal data will always be lazy loaded. Okay, so then the third category of data that they talk about is raw data files. And those are not necessarily RDA files. I suppose they could be, but they, they certainly don't have to be. Um, they'll be accessible to the user for use, and they're usually used for um, examples of loading and parsing raw data or working with raw data. So for example, if your package um, inherently deals with reading in files from, from different file formats. That would be a, a good thing to provide it with, to provide some example raw data files for vignettes or for the user to, to work with. And so these raw data files are stored in um, a nested folder structure. So this is what Stas was talking about earlier. So they're stored in the inst folder, which I think stands for install or installation. 
And when the package is installed, all the files and folders in install are moved up one level into the top level directory. So I'm sorry, I did not type this out right. I should have said they're stored in the inst slash ext data directory. So they're, in st they're stored in ext data, which is nested inside inst. And then when the user installs the package, they won't see inst slash ext data, they'll just see ext data. So that file path will actually change. Um, because of that, you need to be careful not to provide raw data files with names that will conflict with typical parts of an R package. So you wouldn't want to give, you wouldn't want to have a file that like is called description um, or that's called man or something like that. <clears throat> um, let's see, yeah, so use case for this is a key, if a key part of the package's functionality is to act on an external file. So for example, reader, read Excel, and they also provided this use case that, again, I've come across this, but I hadn't really thought about it, which is that maybe a data package would like to provide a CSV version of the data in addition to an R object. And so in the Palmer Penguins um, package, they provide penguins and they provide penguins raw as exported data that's just accessible to the user when you're using the package. But then they also provide it as a CSV um, or as a raw CSV before the cleaning has happened. And I actually saw firsthand why this is useful when I was teaching a carpentries workshop recently, um, because we were teaching with the penguins data that users just pulled in from the data package. But then later in the lesson, we wanted to actually teach them how to read in a CSV file. And so then they were able to access uh, those CSV files as well. Now, this part I got confused because, and I would appreciate if anybody could chime in if you were not confused. I understand what they're doing here, but I don't understand why they're doing it. So here they're talking about writing file paths, and they um, they give an example here of wanting to list out all the files that are provided with a package. They say that you can do this using system file. You can do this with FS, um, path package. And the reason that they're using these, um, these functions is because, as Stas was explaining earlier, the file path is going to change when the user installs the package. Um, and so this fi these files will not be stored in the same place from the developer's perspective as they will be from the user's perspective. Where I got confused is why do we need to list out these files? Like, what's the use case for doing this file path stuff? Um if you want to load them, you need to have the path to load them from. So that's okay. all that this is about. So it's um, just like if you wanted to see what there was and you wanted to see. Well, so they're doing list files just to show you the files, but if you wanted to actually load like clippy.xls, it'd be xdata slash clippy.xls in that system.file call. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. So, for so the, that, does it does it respond dynamically to that? Well, figures out if this is in the source state or in the bundled state or uh, in the binary state, in distributed these, state. These these files are always like left as is, and so it's mm -hmm. it's uh. It, but yes, it so is the path to get there. Oh right, so it it figures it, out okay. Figure out. It yeah. figures out the path to the package. When you specify package equals read Excel, then it figures out well, what's the leap path, blah blah blah, or is it the current package, and then it goes to the X date of that package. Right, you and that's that's the up. trick that that uh, okay. tools load all does is it makes it makes it look at the local place instead of the actual installed one uh, mm -hmm. while you're working on a package. Um, yeah. Similarly, FS path package, and there's also. Um, remember if they were talking about this there's a package um like raptor i think is how you're supposed to pronounce it or raptors but it's r apters oh so, they did mention one additional one that i didn't reproduce here but i don't remember if it was that yeah. one or not um right so for instance I, yeah. I i dropped an example of what we have um yeah for instance we, we have uh, our markdown templates for reports and this could go to X data and mm -hmm. then you can you can you can if we provide the functionality of running those reports, we could say, well, I'll pick this up from 
whatever the current location is, I don't know where it's going to be on the <laughs> user yeah. end, and I can do this with system file. That's really helpful. Thank you. Um, I I think I needed sort of a tangible example of of using this, and now now that makes sense. Um, so I because I was confused about all the different places <laughs> to put things, I made a table. Um, this table it. So caveat, caveat, it's not totally complete. Also, I might have gotten stuff wrong, so correct me, but I think it's a useful addition. So we've got our exported data, our internal data, and our raw data. And to summarize, you know, what is this? What is the use case for it? Where do we put it? Um, what's the file format? How do we make and store it? And then where does that making and storing happen, which I think in all cases is in the data raw folder. They didn't actually specify for this raw data. They didn't specify a lot of these things. For example, um, I assume the raw data does not get lazy loaded because by definition, it's kind of not in an RDA format and it's something that you would manually load. So I think that's a no. Um, and then it also doesn't get documented. They didn't say anything about documenting external files. Does anyone know about that? I mean, it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't formally. Usually right. you end up documenting it wherever, like whatever it's there for. So if it's there to show you how to, you know, how this processor function works mm -hmm. within that function, you would mention that it's there. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think we're going to talk a little bit more about inst in a chapter or two. Um, and so they'll probably go into it more there but okay. yeah generally these things i think it just get documented kind of incidentally does anyone have any info to say that i'm wrong about that i can't think of anywhere formal that you do it um vignettes which we'll talk about later would be another mm -hmm. place that they're likely you're likely to talk about stuff that's mm -hmm. in here because so i i guess the idea is these are they're there for for a reason and so right. wherever <laughs> you talk about why it's there, then that's where you would document it. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty much what I figured. Um, <laughs> it's like the, for this first, you are not trying to share the data. So your point is not to share the data, it's to use as example for an interface. Mm -hmm. For example, right. we have that folder in the tidy SL package. If you use why, um, you know, while uh, Excel files, they have some examples and they provide those examples inside a package. So you don't need to go to any GitHub repo to download. Mm -hmm. You just, they just have a function and they have the bit dash. Using that example, you just need, you just, you just can copy and the code and it will mm -hmm. run because the data and the Excel file that you need to run the sample is already with the package. Yeah, that makes total sense. So that also supports the idea of things being sort of incidentally documented as they're used. Um, okay, yes. cool. So I'll I can update and expand this before <laughs> um, before formally integrating it into the slides. Um, I don't know. I don't know if this table is useful for other people. I found it useful because um, I got a little confused about the where where do you put all the things and when. But um, I think I get it now. So I will say on the other piece of like um, where to make it. Yeah, you could in data raw, like explain where that came from. But a lot of times it's just going to, you know, it'll be a sample. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I don't know. I, I, it wouldn't be a bad idea. The more I, as I was going to say that, I'm like, you know, probably even if you're downloading it from somewhere to include in your package and that's all you're doing, right? doing that within a data raw file would probably be a good idea. Um. I'm sure that I have screwed that up before and, you know, done the ggplot2 thing of, mm -hmm. oh, I have no idea where this came from. Um, so, like, data raw is really, it it isn't a formal thing. It's just mm -hmm. an ignored directory. Right. So you could really do anything in there that you want. Um and so, yeah, which that was another thing that came up for me when I was reading because they were talking about creating stuff, um, creating, for example, cleaned up data to be exported to the user. And presumably, like you're getting that from somewhere, like you're you've got some raw, raw, raw data that you're then going to process. And they didn't specify where that lives. Presumably, it also lives in data raw. 
But so I think they sort of said without saying it that data raw is kind of an anything goes, you can have data, you can have scripts that just kind of live there. Um, you do what you need to do, it's there if it needs to be accessed. And then um, you take the necessary steps to put the finished products where they need to go. Yes, and it, it only, data raw only exists during like development of the package. It doesn't, like it's not on CRAN. Uh -huh. um, and so you can do really whatever. It's just, it's stuff for you or anyone you're collaborating with gotcha. to have access to in order to recreate it. Um, and I've I've done some cases, like I have packages that I'm generating things using scripts. And so I made R raw, which is mm. equivalent to data raw of I'm generating R code using files in here. Um, and you can just do that same thing. You know, you just create it, put it in, our building ignore, and then it's as if it doesn't exist. Um, so, uh, but yeah, I think it would be a good idea to formally put anything, um, put things in a raw folder somewhere, <laughs> anything that you're, any code you're using to generate your package. So we're gonna talk about other things in inst. Well, I guess you could also self-document in some cases, like if, it, if it's a file format that has comments in it, you can put comments in that code of where you downloaded it from or mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. That'd be the only other option, I think. Yeah, and your mention of R raw um, reminded me of another point that I wanted to bring up. I think part of the reason that I found this chapter confusing or that I've found dealing with data to be confusing is that it's not always intuitive where you put stuff. And part of that is the naming because you've got this data raw folder <laughs> which implies that that's where you put the raw data. But in <laughs> fact, that's where you put both the raw data and the scripts to process the data, which is not at all intuitive to me. You would think that would go under the, the R folder. And then for the internal data, um, you store the created RDA file under the R folder, even though the code, the R code that generates it is stored under the data raw folder, which to me seems really backwards. And if you think about it really hard and you sort of read through the chapter and you think about why everything is where it is, it does start to make sense. But just from a sort of surface level, like you're trying to memorize where things go, it does not, it's not intuitive at all. Um, which is why I wanted to make this table because I needed a side-by-side -side <laughs> comparison um, and then naming is hard. <laughs> Yes. Well, I, I think a partial, at least a partial answer to that is that figure 3.1 on yeah. source bundle and binary. I'm, I'm staring at it right now. Um, Get it up for a second. 3.1. Where is it? Um, it's pretty, it's laid in the chapter. 3.3.1. 3.3.1. Oh, 3.3.1. Oh, Got it. Yeah. Here it yes. is. Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Basically, it shows... Well, data is a system folder for our, our yeah. packages. So stuff is going to be processed within that folder. Mm -hmm. Man is a recognized folder name. R is basically where R is going to go to look for function definitions and put them together into the package RDB, RDX. Mm -hmm. um, SRC, that's where C code leaves, blah, 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 tests, inst, <laughs> vignettes. Mm -hmm. Those are recognized names. Uh, right. My understanding is that basically anything else, anything goes, mm -hmm. and it's just not going to be accessed by build mm -hmm. at the build time. Right. So it's not going to be incorporated into the package. It's going to produce uh, warnings with, with DevTools check. It's going to say, well, you have this folder that's mm -hmm. not a part of... An installation, oh. I don't know what to do with it. Let me know what blah, blah. I'm, I'm freaking out. Do something. Um, well, that's, but then if you put it in our build ignore, you don't even get those warnings. Yes. Yep. Yep. Exactly. So. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. And the reason for that is the, if it's in our build ignore, like it doesn't go, like um, readme.rmd is one of the few examples here. Oh, and the articles directory that they're, the the anything that's in the gray so readme.rmd is our build ignored so it doesn't make it into the bundle mm -hmm. it's only for you only for the developer and that's the same 
Um, I don't remember if Data Raw is in their list. It isn't. Oh, yeah, yeah there it is. So they list it down here. Yeah. That it's another one that's it's just for you slash anyone who's like working on the source code of the package. It doesn't, it's not in the actual bundled mm -hmm. version of the package. And so that's why the files for creating the data go in data raw because they don't go to the user. The data goes to the user, not the creation of the data. Yeah, totally. Um, so yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I almost might like in my own work, I might call it something like data processing or data preparation or something to like make myself go less insane and then have a raw data folder <laughs> in, nested inside of that. Um, but maybe I'm more likely to remember now that I've, now that I've like laid it out for myself and gone through all of this. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, that... it's, it's kind of like conventions. If you look at right. other people's yeah. GitHub repos, you would understand, well, data are always where stuff is. If <laughs> you call it data dot processing, data dash processing, that's understandable. <laughs> I think people yeah. will figure out this is, this this is the folder that's responsible for that task. It's one of those where I'm like, I'm pretty sure that would be absolutely like I know it would be fine, right? But, but there might be positive. there might be things that well, I, I know it would work fine. It would just that there might be something you would miss out on eventually. Sure. Like they'll in, implement something and use this, mm -hmm. and oh, if I just had data raw in all of my packages, then this new yeah. fancy thing would work for me. <laughs> so huh? that would be the reason I would caution against. Uh, going against the green. But other than that, it would work Good fine. Point. Good point. Okay, so the last parts of this chapter, which I'm going to give kind of a high level overview in part because we'll they linked to more sources and in part because I only half understood them, but they're good to touch on. Um, our internal state and um, the more durable um, user information. So for internal state, uh, this is when you want to store user-specific or system-specific data that functions might need to reference, um, but that need to be sort of discovered or um, determined when the package is loaded. So for example, um, if the information in question needs to be determined at load time, not when the package is built, or if the information can change, if it's dynamic. Um, another example they gave is maybe the information technically could be passed by the user as an argument to the function manually, but it would be really annoying or cumbersome, or maybe the user doesn't even really know the information themselves. Um, so some example use cases, and I put these up front because I read that intro material and I was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And then they later got to the examples. So example use cases are, let's say that you want to allow the user to modify the um, some of the variables in the environment, like um, getting and setting a list of information. And that's the example that they go over later. Um, or functions might need to know the current project directory, like use this. When you run the use this functions, it sort of knows where you're located in the project, which project it's dealing with. Um, or like the package Google Drive needs to use the user's home directory um, on Google Drive. And I think somewhere in the chapter, they said something like, um, technically, you know, you could force the user to put in the URL for their home Google Drive uh, directory every single time they use a Google Drive function. But that would be super cumbersome and annoying and people might mess it up. And so it makes more sense to just sort of obtain that information one time and then use it repeatedly um, over and over, sort of cache it and then use it when you need it. And they link to this blog post here, which I won't go into right now, um, about uh, more information on how to do this caching and um, use package-wide variables. But they did go over one example of using this internal state. So for some reason, you're writing a package that stores the user's favorite letters of the alphabet. Um, and so intuitively you might try to do something like this. You might, so you're in your, you're in an R script here inside your R directory. So you're writing some functions. You might start by making one of these very small, um, internal data items. So this is an example of what they were talking about before. If it's a vector of three elements, you can just create it right in the, um, the function code, no problem. So you create this vector of A, B, and C. And then you define a function that will just report the contents of favorite letters. And it's this very simple function here. And then you make another function that allows the user to actually change these favorite letters and set their own favorite letters. So actually my favorite letters are 
K, L, and M, not A, B, and Z, and I might want to change that. Um, so this allows them to pass in the letters argument, and it up takes this old favorite letters, and then it tries to overwrite the object favorite letters with this new letters that the user is passing in. And they're using this double um, assignment arrow to attempt to write an object to the global environment from inside a function, um, which is not amazing best practice. And also in this case, it's gonna turn out to not work. Um, so this might be your first attempt at how you would write a package that allows a user to get and set their favorite letters. But when you do this, it fails. It gives you an error message that I didn't copy paste here, um, but can go back if anybody wants to look at it. And basically it tells you that you can't change the binding for objects in the package's namespace. That's not allowed. They do go into a caveat on there is one very, very particular way that you would be able to do this. But for effectively, you can't, you're not allowed to do this. Um, so you should only define those small data objects like favorite letters. If they are permanent, they're gonna be used by a bunch of functions. You won't need to change them later. But what if you do actually wanna have this functionality for the user to modify that data and have it stored in the R session? So the way they've shown to do this is to use what's called an internal package environment. And here at the top of their code, they start by defining this internal package environment and they call it the, and then they initialize these variables, not just as simple variable names, but as um, I guess items, like elements of the environment, the, so they're just using our familiar dollar sign operation, basically defining favorite letters as an element inside this environment. And otherwise the definition looks exactly the same. And then we have the same code that we had before, except instead of just referring to objects in the global environment, we're now referring to objects in this specific environment. So again, this function will just report on the favorite letters. And then this function, every instance of favorite letters has been replaced by the dollar sign favorite letters. Um, and now we retrieve and we reset that variable. So now it works. You can grab my favorite letters, uh, ABC. You can set them to J, F, and B or whatever you want. And now you ask for them again and they are again set. So here we've used our internal environment to, um, to get and set the package uh, state. So some notes on this is that the environment only persists for the current R session. It's not gonna, if you reload the package, right? Reloading the package will rerun all of this code, including the definition of the environment as an empty environment. So it will erase the prior knowledge that we have. Um, they made a note that they, the reason they use the as the environment name is so that you can read your code kind of like English. So you can say like the favorite letters, um, the object, the object, whatever. Um, which I thought was kind of interesting because I definitely was confused as to why they were doing it that way. And they talk about when to define the environment. So in this example, the environment is just defined at the top of the script where it's going to be used. And that's totally fine if you're going to use it in just like one of your functions or you're only going to use it in a certain family of functions and that family of functions is all defined in the same R script. Um, but if you're going to need to use this in many different functions that are scattered throughout the package, or if you need to use it sort of from the beginning um, of loading the package, you should define it in a separate script. They give the example of aaa.r, so you can make sure that that function is defined basically before anything else gets defined. Um, so that's, I feel like probably most of the time that would be self-explanatory, but it totally could trip you up if you were gonna like try to use your environment in different places. And then they do a little bit of talking about persistent user data. So if you want the data to persist, not just within an R session, but actually across different R sessions and not be reinitialized every time the package is loaded. If you wanna do that, inherently you're gonna have to store data on the user's disk. And then the big question is, where do you put the file? And I linked to the standards that they linked to for storing data to the user's disk. And it sounds like the answer is pretty much don't. Um, <laughs> it's not polite, it's not recommended, it could overwrite stuff, it's just a bad idea. If you absolutely must, um, these are, this is a quote from the CRAN guidelines, 
Basically, you're allowed to store user-specific data, configuration, and cache files in the user directories obtained in this specific way using the R user dir function. And if you're going to do that, you have to commit to actively managing those files and removing anything that's outdated. Um, so this tools user tools um, <laughs> R user dir function obtains the file path where um, you're allowed to store data in the user's directory. And so you can use that. And they gave a couple examples of using that um, to get that file path and to then use it. But they ended with basically another admonition, like, are you sure you need to do this? And they gave a couple examples like passwords, authentication, um, things where it might be really tempting to you as the package developer to want to store information durably that can be used across sessions. And they basically said there are tools that exist to do this. There are already packages that have been set up that manage things like authentication. And so they're saying, you know, if you're tempted to try to work on this and you're tempted to try to sort of DIY a storage solution for this type of data, maybe invest that time instead in learning how to use one of the ones that already exist because they're more secure, they're less likely to do damage, and they're just going to be, they're going to better serve you in your package. Um, I think that is it. That was the end of the chapter. I skipped out, I skipped over a couple of the side sort of caveat call out boxes that they had. Um, so if anybody wants to go back to any particular details of anything we can, but otherwise, I guess, questions, discussion, um, anything like that. Great, right, thanks for the presentation. I have a question related to, to writing data because uh, I know that the RMM package creates you a dot profile file. That that would be the point of this. That that's maybe the system that they're using to create those files because they create a directory in your mm -hmm. in your project to store your package. Which package are you talking about? Do you say R E M V? Oh yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, maybe they are using this internally to get the path for the user's directory so they know where to put that file. Does anyone know more details about that? Well, RNF uses a lot of black magic, right? So uh, it, well, the logic for the current directory, I think is similar to the library here. They figure out well. This is this is the current folder, and this is uh, where we could go to. But there's also uh, a variety of RN system variables like RN sandbox, RN cache, um, and some other stuff. So um, that's um, you can fiddle with those if you really understand what you're doing. Uh, I have to read it up every time when I'm setting this up or resetting on uh, trying to figure something out uh, because for some of the projects, I want all the packages to be with the part of that project. For other projects, I'm fine picking this up from a common cache uh, and those those would have to be set up differently. Um, and yeah, it, it gets this... I don't like this going to user directory uh, because, well, that's very strong danger of things not being compatible between different people working on the same project when stuff is getting configured to Stas Kalenikov instead of Kayagam. Uh, and we end up with different versions of packages, which is exactly the problem that RF is trying to solve. So to the extent possible, I try to slap RNFs wrists from going into my user directories, but that's not always possible. Sometimes it goes to Stas of sandbox and oh my God, I still I need to go back and figure out where to to reconfigure that option. Yeah, and go, going for our profile, well our profile that RNF goes to is specific to the current project and um it's not such a great deal to figure that out with those um, um, get WD and here and whatnot. And that's how it finds it, if that's the question.
Um, <clears throat> yeah, thanks. Thanks again, Kaya, for the awesome presentation. Um, I was curious, I'm not sure if you know this or maybe someone else does, but if you're building a data package, like, is there like a size limit you need to be aware of? Yeah, so I skipped over the part on compression, um, but there was a small section on different methods of compressing data. Let me see if I can find that. Um, if anybody knows the size limit off the top of their head, uh, you can yell it out. But yes, you do need to be aware of how big you're making your data. Uh, let me find this. Okay, so... For larger data sets, you might want to experiment with the compression setting, which is under the control of the compress argument. Yeah, so I don't know the difference between all these different compression settings, and you can look into it um, if you need that uh, size. Oh, here we go. Submitting to CRAN, generally packaged data should be smaller than a megabyte, or you have to argue for an exception. And it's uh, arguing for an exception is easier to do if you have a dedicated data package, yeah. So I actually ran up into an issue sort of like this um, with the package I was writing and I wasn't intending on submitting to CRAN so that wasn't really a problem, um, but I was doing like an internal package for my lab group that handles some fairly large data. And one of the functions that I wanted to highlight in my vignette was a function that specifically dealt with downsampling and it did so in a way that it was really hard to create a minimal reproducible example. Um, I think it's still possible. I think I just didn't have enough time to devote to figuring out how to make a convincing smaller example that would still hit all the uses of the function. Um, I had a similar problem for testing. Like I needed to be able to run tests um, on data that was large enough that the use cases in question actually would crop up and some of them inherently depended on the data being large. So I, I was having some trouble um, with having really large files there. But yeah, I think the answer to that is just learn to make better reproducible examples, which is on my to-do list. <laughs> right, well, this, this kind of touches on the question of serialization and uh, there are, well, the standard format is RDS, but there are also others. Uh, so there's QS package, quick save, uh, and there is also fast something, fast package and there's been comparison between them so some of them are only deal with data frames while i think qs deals with any uh our objects but those are not standard right so this is just the matter of if you want to speed up the read times uh you can use those i will i'll also be using parquet uh for really large files but that's like in the domain when you start hitting gigabytes rather than megabytes and that's an entirely different story uh, I don't think you'll be distributing gigabytes with any package. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, so the package that I've, I've been working on for the past eight months, it has the internal object of about 60 meg, I think, and we just laser load it and it just lives there. It's documented there. There are five functions that create it. Um, and we went through this chapter up and down and diagonally and diagonally back and every possible case <laughs> crossing that direction is to figuring out what to do. That. First we exported it and figured out this is a bad idea and this is why and uh, um, yeah <laughs> get to read all of that. Thanks. That's both of those are that's helpful information. Um, yeah, I'm also um, in the planning stage of creating a package and trying to figure out what makes most sense for the data package, or if a data package even makes sense for my what I'm trying to create. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question because I've heard people talking about data packages more and more um, and like recommending data packages more and more as a way of distributing data. Um, but of course, much, a lot of data is huge. So that's, uh, but I guess then you have multiple files. And so anyway, yeah. And I guess it doesn't say when it says package data should be smaller than a megabyte, do they mean all of the data or do they mean each individual file? I assume they mean all of the data together. It's all of the data. Yeah. Yeah. It does limit you. 
I think yeah. I think technically it can be four megs. That that number's in my head for some reason. Um, but yeah. maybe it's one. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it's not it's not very big. Uh if you split it off into a data package, that'll buy you some space on you know, and Cran will still accept it, but you know, not infinite. <laughs> mm -hmm. And so then, you know, the next level up is you have to have somewhere external that it's saved and then have the user download it. Um which I actually right. So yeah, so thing. yeah. One of the um, package data stories that I can share is that uh, our my organization work collects the general social survey. Uh, and there's a package called GSSR developed by Kieran Healy. Uh, you may have heard the name if you're on mm -hmm. what was known as X. Uh, uh, and now he's on Mastodon, I think. Anyway, so he and he deals with GSN since 1960s, and that's a data file of about 200 megabytes. So that package only exists on uh, on GitHub, it cannot go on, on CRAN because it's just a huge file, and uh, he just holds the microdata and uh, just reads that state of file dot DTA with Haven and works with it. Uh, one in internal initiative that we've had was to provide an API uh, so that tabulations out of the data set could be um, generated very easily, and we all got excited about that so that package GSSR could go on CRAN because, well, its functions are what? I don't know, 50k of code. Uh, this is kind of, that's nothing to talk about, but um, API, Plumber APIs is another way of dealing with, with um, access issues to large files. If that's something that you can internalize, um, that's that may be another way of um, dealing with your data size issues. I think, so Rebecca just uh, posted um, the actual policies and it's the tarballs can be up to 10 megabytes now, it looks like. I'm pretty sure that is an update, so that's interesting. Um, but yeah, 10 megabytes is very small. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I posted that at my old job, we we made a package for like, there were a few different packages, both that we wrote and that other people had written that basically had all this code around downloading something if the user doesn't already have it, otherwise using the copy that they already have. And so we made that package that is basically just that. It's just um, functions to download, potentially process, and then cache a file. Um, so if you were like, this was, specifically around working with um, like large language models and that kind of thing. Uh, it's just a way to download and cache things um, because that's, you know, it's a thing that uh, you're, you know, we work with data. So sometimes you have giant data that you want to work with. <laughs> um, so uh, it is interesting to me that it isn't really solved still. Um, kind of on both sides because storing the data like you technically you can store almost anything on github but you're like skirting policies sometimes when you do that and so i'm always afraid that the data is going to disappear someday when they decide to actually enforce uh data size policies so maybe you put it on like you can get some free storage on amazon or you can get there's um so like data.world has some levels of free storage, but mm -hmm. storing large things that you're trying to provide to people is tricky. Um, so yeah, you know, GitHub, you can, I think that's probably the kind of accepted way you, you have to do it as a release in the, in your repo. Well, then... for academic purposes, there is this concept of data versus, and there are all sorts of repos. Yeah. Uh, so I know that the biomedical world in the U.S. has its own concept of <laughs> general purpose repositories, which is something quite different from what I think of. But Dataverse, I think, is originated at Harvard, Harvard, okay. uh, and that's the social science -y, uh <laughs> kind of thing. Uh, so it's 
there is between um, political science and economics, most of those, and some sociology, and there are also repositories like ICPSR, an Inter University Consortium for Polit Pol Political Social Science Research at University of Michigan. They get the focus on social science data, um, and that is usually associated with academic research projects for kind of non-profit worlds. I don't really know what good storage things are. Um, Dataverse, I think, would be able to accept your packages, uh, your, your your data packages relatively easily. That's good to know. Yeah, and then you 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 can get a free UI with that, and it's um, it's pretty much it's 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 very stable. Okay, yeah, I've downloaded things from Dataverse. I just uh, haven't ever dug into it. Mm -hmm. Um, Oops. yeah, it is. Yeah, that's good to know. Definitely good to know. Um, you know, like uh, we we have the Tidy Tuesday repo on GitHub that is mm -hmm. huge because we add a new data set every week. <laughs> and so, um, I, and that is something that, you know, long-term I'd like to kind of um, make that more sustainable. Cause like right now, if you want to contribute by like in the normal way, by downloading the entire repo, it takes a while uh, because you've got to download all of the data sets. Um, so, uh, working that out would probably be a good idea. Very cool. I need to get right. going, everyone. Um, yep. thank you <laughs> <Me too>. all. <laughs> um, before everyone goes, are we still planning on meeting next week? Um, it's on the calendar, but I noticed it's MLK day. So I'm not sure if folks oh. will be, um, away or not. I'll, I can still I'll be available. Um, yeah, let's uh, let's let's check in the channel. Um, but okay. mm -hmm. I can I can be around. But if anyone else, you know, if anyone wants to skip, then we can talk about that. Okay. Um, that is very cool. All right. Um. All right. Yeah. We'll talk about that on the channel because I also have to run. <laughs> okay. Sounds good. Uh, I'll see you either next week or in two weeks. Then. <laughs> All right. All right. Bye, everyone.